Do you love spy books, movies, and TV? Then the Spybrary podcast is for you. Since 2017, host Shane Whaley and Spybrary field agents around the world dispatch reviews and interviews with authors, historians, and fellow spy fans. We discuss everything from John le Carre, Len Dayton, Paul Vidic, Graham Greene, Nick Heron, Charles Cumming, Ben McIntyre, and, and many more. Spybrary is available on all good podcast apps and at spybrary.com. Hello and welcome to episode 239 of the Spybury podcast. In this episode, I'm in the field. Whaley goes to Westminster. Don't worry, I'm not running for office, heaven forbid. I actually had a tea break with Gordon Henderson, MP. Gordon has written several spy books and we're in Westminster to chat with him about Stephen Statton, a very working class spy. We dig into that. And Mr. Henderson shares why he's such a big fan, like many of us, of Leonard Cyril Dayton. We also put him through the quick fire round. So join us for this tea break in the Palace of Westminster with me, Shane Whaley, for Spy Brewery. Mr. Henderson, Member of Parliament for Sittingbourne and Sheppey in the uh, county of Kent. Fantastic. Thank the, you for the inviting Garden us. of England. Thank you for inviting me to Parliament, to uh, the, the Palaces of Westminster. It's a real honour to be here. I, I still revere this place. Um, it's the cradle not just of the UK's democracy, this is the cradle of the world's democracy. So before we get into spy fiction, which we're here to talk about today, it'd be remiss of me not to ask you, as a sitting member of Parliament, how you view some of these shenanigans that have been going on lately that are almost something you'd expect to read in a spy fiction novel, right? The whole honey trap, the targeting, alleged spying offences by parliamentary aides. What, what's your take on it all? All I would say is no, I've never been tapped up by any agent, whether it's a, a, a British agent or a, 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 a hostile agent. Um, but look, I'm sure these things do go on. Yeah. I don't think it's as widespread as the media would make out. So what was it about spy fiction? When you started reading spy fiction, we're both huge fans of Len Dayton. We'll get on to that in a moment. What was it about spy fiction that captured your imagination? Well, it, 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 when I grew up, you know, we had a working, a working class boy off a council estate in the Medway Towns in, in Kent we didn't have access to much literature, even at school. I mean, at school, uh, we were confined to uh, Henry V and Shakespeare and um, the Ancient Mariner, and that's about it, basically. Yeah. yeah. So I uh, I started reading James Bond from a relatively early age, and it was only when I was fifteen or sixteen when I read. The Ipcrest file, mm. that I realised actually there was something better than James Bond and uh, something that actually reflected more my way of life and my background, uh, which James Bond, although it was exciting, uh, never really reflected the real world. You know, it was, you know, it was exciting, but mm. whereas the Ipcrest file, in particular, and that wasn't, I don't believe that was the best book, by the way, but The Ipcrest It's Fire. a tricky one to read. That's quite a challenging read. It, it, it is, uh, especially for a, a teenager. Yes. yes. Uh, for a teenager. Uh, and it's only in later life when I've reread it several times, you pick up a lot of the better parts of it, to be honest. Yeah. Um, but it was only then that I realised that it's, there is more than romanticised fiction, that this was a gritty. And I like that. That that suited me down to the ground, as a uh, as one of life's natural cynics. Uh, I, I thought it reflected what I want. So that's how I got into the reading of, of spy books. And I, I you know, Len Dayton, uh, I've read every single one of his novels, not once, not twice, three times. You know, and uh, you know, I can I can go to all of his earlier novels and I can read it again and still pick up things I had missed before. What are your favourite Dayton books? All of them are the uh, the Bernard Sam Sam Samson trilogies. Absolutely, you know, I, I I could I could read those again and again and again, and still find different things within it that uh, I didn't didn't notice the first time around. And that's the great thing about 
Len Dayton is that it is intricate and it's interesting. And, and it's not just his spy books, of course, although we have to talk about spy books, but mm. you know, things like uh, Only When I Laugh as a comedy was, I think, really good. Yeah. Uh, and there are, you know, his Bomber and uh, other other books that he wrote. But, you know, the, the genre of the spy novel is what I really like and what I want you to... Uh, and have the, the first bit of writing I ever did was a short story mm -hmm. that was published in a magazine called New Bond, which was the house magazine of Woolworths. Right. right. When, I, okay. when I worked for Woolworths. Yeah. Yes. Uh, and that was a spy story based very much on Len Dayton's work, at, as I saw it as a 17-year-old. Yeah. Yes. So I, it's clear from the, the title of your, your latest book, Very Working Class Spy, that Len Dayton has a huge influence on your writing, Len. He, he did. That, yeah. And I like to think that, not deliberately, but because it reflects me, that my writing reflects that cynicism, uh, that underplaying of characters that he, he does so well. The opening to your book, and uh, again, we don't go down spoiler Strasser on the show because we want people to, to read the book, but we, we'll set a little bit about it. The opening of, of your book is very much uh, reminiscent, for me, very reminiscent of uh, Len's writing in that you have the, the different MI5, MI6, the diff and you, you have the hero of, the, of your story coming in and uh, very, very sarcastic, almost a couldn't care less attitude towards... Um, his colleague, shall we say, and I thought that well, was a very yeah, interesting okay. opening. I, I, well, I think that it reflected once again the cynicism that I, I sometimes feel for authority. And, and actually, I've always believed, you know, say being a working class boy, that I'm as good and as uh, equal to anybody, I don't know whether they're royalty or who they are. We're, we're all the same. And, uh, you know, whilst you can respect and. Uh, like your superiors, be your boss or whatever, uh, it doesn't mean saying you have to be deferential towards them. And uh, I, know, I know the bit you're talking about uh, um, when uh, they're having a meeting in the the old uh, wine cellar, uh, right. which uh, has been turned into a cinema. And he stands in front of this screen, pouring himself a cup of coffee, and is told off by his boss. And he says, well, I just finished top it up and get some biscuits and I'll come and join you. Now, yeah. Yeah, and, and that, to me, uh, and the, the thing about it, as the thread goes, and we're not going to say, we're not going to do a spoiler, but as you go through the through the book, the relationship between Stephen Statton and his boss becomes more equal as you go through it and, yes. as you, and you recognise that actually, while she tolerates him because she has a lot of respect for him and she puts up with some of his sarcasm because she recognises his qualities. And that's... You know, it's all part of a thread. I mean, I'm curious to know, as a member of parliament, you say you're anti-authority, and in your day job you have to deal with royals and barons and lords and ministers, and how does that play well, out? I, I treat them all as I would one of my constituents. You know, yeah. I, I respect them as long as they're doing their job properly, uh, as I would think my constituents respect me for doing my job properly. But um, uh, if people are acting as fools then you know i have no respect for them got it um could you share more with us about the plot of the book it's a continuation of two earlier books that i wrote yes, yes. one called uh, operation seal island and the other the mandela project one of which was set in, set in south africa and uh, the other was set in westminster but it was with the same main character who was david statton and this book follows David Statton's son Stephen who has gone into the same department as he did in the in the in the Secret Service uh, and is very complex I think it's a very complex book because mm. it it has a number of strands in it, it is it, it, the, the fundamental thesis is that there is a uh, Iranian Iraqi plot using the mafia to flood the streets of not just the UK, but the West with uh, heroin and cocaine uh, to to try and destroy society mm -hmm. through the, uh, and it's topical here in the UK because it's it's done via the county lines. And so it's, the, so that that's the thesis. Uh, and so it's not just set in the UK, but it's, it, there's also set in Canada, 
uh, in the uh, the British Arm training unit in in, in Canada. Uh, it's in Venice. It's in Iraq. It's in Iran. It's in Afghanistan. So it, it's different parts of it, and you follow. Uh, Stephen Statton as he tries to counter this threat uh, and the odd thing about it which is which is goes against the grain of most writing and once again Lynn Dayton did this successfully but very few authors do is it's all done in the first person singular mm-hmm. right up until it, it's, it's a four part book and then the right up until the last part where it switches over to third party um, because then you are looking at it through the eyes of different people in different strands, and it brings all the strands of the story together in, in the in the conclusion. Got it. Villains can be quite hard to write. Can you tell us a bit more about your villains, in particular the butcher Cassidy? Well, I, I, I write my characters are often based on people that I've known in my life, <laughs> in my background and that. I'm not going to your local butcher. butcher. No, no, he, well, he, he, he was, but he was a thug. Yeah. But yeah. he, he, uh, he left school without any qualifications and went to work in a, in a butcher shop and actually eventually, through crime, managed to get enough money to buy the shop and then build up a, 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 a string of uh, butcher shops in South London and an abattoir which has a very important part of the story that I'm not going to go into. Yes, yes. Yeah, it almost reminded me when I was reading that, that that scene, if you saw the film with Bob Hoskins, The Long Good Friday, um, from the late 70s, and there's a scene there where he gets the villains into an abattoir and all his meat is hanging up. So it, re- it reminded me of that scene. But, you know, he keeps his hand in, doesn't he, the villain? He, he does. does a bit of butchering. He does which a, bit, a, bit, a bit of butchering at all, yes. But I'll say, without going, we won't go into too many details in that. But, uh, yeah, I, I, so he, I remember I have come into contact with one or two, two thuggish people in my worrying and, and scary thuggish like people mm. by the way so and that's what he turns out but in the end of the day um he is uh, he he's able to be beaten by our hero yes yes. Yes. yes when a reader finishes your, your book what do you want them to get out of it you? well funnily enough uh, and this is absolutely true I was chatting to uh, uh, one of the booking clerks at my local railway station about a month ago, and he was telling me, oh, he likes reading, and his wife had told him he's got to get rid of some of these books. So you've got, like, oh, yeah, I love books. I said, I'll get you one of mine. So I gave him one of my books, and uh, another booking clerk said that when I went the, the next day, well, yeah, yeah, how come you gave him a book and you haven't given me a book? So I gave him a book. Eventually, all the booking clerks had, had copies of my book. and uh, But the first guy... Uh, said to me after about three weeks, um, oh, I finished your book, and it's a long book. And I said, oh, good. He said, he said, yeah, I enjoyed it so much. I'm trying to find other books you've written. And that's nice. the epitome of what I want to achieve, that someone will read it and say, hey, I want to find out more. What, what else can I, how, how else can I be entertained? Are you on the hunt for your next thrilling spy read? Look no further. Spybury contributor and Sunday Times chief political commentator Tim Shipman has curated a list of his top 125 spy authors ranked. This list includes both classic and modern writers, making it the ultimate guide for any spy fan. Tim also recommends which book to try first from each author, and he shares his favourite book from each of them too, so you can dive right into the best of the best. Head over to spybury.com forward slash top125 to grab your free copy now. Don't miss out on the ultimate spy reading list. Brilliant. We will add all the links to your books on our website, so on the show notes for this episode today, so our readers don't have to go and, and search for them. It'll be all there for them to buy. So, Question I have for you, so you've managed to write books whilst you're also working in this hectic world of politics. Like, how, do you, how do you manage your time to be able to write as well as do the day job? Well, the, they, unlike a full-time writer, mm-hmm. my books take longer. <laughs> yeah. So, so. Uh, the, uh, the, the Stephen Statham book, from when I started it through to when I uh, finished it was probably about three years. Yeah. And uh, I do it by, because you can't write to order. The thing about writing books, you can't write to order. You can't say, oh, I'm going to write this book and then oh, I've got to write this chapter and that chapter and I'm going to write so many words a day. It's when you get the inspiration 
and I might get the inspiration in the middle of the night. Might get the I might get the inspiration on the train up to London, and so I might make some few notes on on the when I'm writing. I might then take a break for lunch, and I'll sit and do a bit of writing. Then from here till uh, this last week, for instance, I was here till midnight on on Monday. So um, and towards the end of the night, while you're sitting waiting to vote, um, and you're not actually taking part in the in debate, I sit and do some writing then. And if I'm at home. If my, if my wife uh, wants to watch uh, programmes that I don't particularly want to watch, mm. I'll sit there, put my headphones on, listen, listen to some music and sit and write. So you can do it when you do it. and But when you start doing it, you just want to carry on doing it, especially if you've got a theme in your mind. And then you'll go through ages where you don't have anything in your mind. Yeah. You know, the, 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 the sequel that I'm starting to write, I'm up to chapter five now of, uh, of it. And it took me ages to put together an idea as to how I wanted to take the book because this this book actually finishes in January 2020, just before, just when COVID was coming out. Yes. And I wanted to take it on because the end of this book, which I'm not going to give the end, what this end, but the end words are, you know what you've got to do is to effectively to find the traitor in, in the organisation. And, and and so this takes it on to him trying to find that traitor. And, but we're in the COVID area. And now we're into an area where uh, we're going to be moving into lockdown, where we're going to have, uh, there are going to be no flights, mm. you know. And so uh, you try and reflect that without it affecting the story too much. And uh, I just read, read a book uh, by Stephen King called Holly, which is not a horror story. It's a continuation of a series of books that, that uh-huh. Stephen King's wrote, written, uh, more thriller. And th- this one is based during that COVID era when people are uh, wearing masks and in lockdown, and he does it in a really nice, subtle way. And I've got to try and reflect that somehow. So that's that's going to be a challenge. Uh, and I struggled with that to start with, but now I'm uh, now starting to get to get to grips with it, and I've got it all in my mind yeah. where I want to head with it. Brilliant. I have to ask you, you say you listen to music while you write. What kind of music do you listen to? Any easy listening. I mean, I, I'll sit and it depends what I, what I move, but, uh, you know, I, I, I listen to it. Perhaps listen to classic music, or yeah. I'll, I'll sit and listen to. My favourite is uh, Diana um, Crow, mm-hmm. the Canadian singer. Yeah. So you, should, you know, a bit of jazz music, and so I'll, I'll, I'll you know, I'll, whatever, whatever yeah. I feel like on the time. But okay. it's got to be something. Uh, you know, I can't write to rock music. Yeah. yeah, I couldn't put the Rolling Stones on. I could put Moody Blues on, which I do. So, so a bit of Moody Blues in the background. It's great. I can do that. So uh, uh, Mark Knopfler is another great favourite of mine. Yeah. Yes. And once again, he's somebody you can listen to at the same time as writing. So that's what Absolutely. I like. Absolutely. Good. Good. So um, you are stepping down from Parliament. You're retiring. You've served 14 years here. Um, 14 what, years. i would have been here 14 years next week. 14 years. Congratulations. That's a, that's a fair innings here. Will you go into full-time writing once... Uh, in November, whenever the election is held, whenever the election is, um, I'll probably carry on working a little bit yeah. uh, with my successor uh, as long as I get uh, elected, just to get some continuity. But yeah, I will be taking break, t- taking time out, uh, and well, we'll have more time to write then. Yeah. Yes. Uh, and then I can concentrate and say, right, you know, I'm going to get up in the morning. And uh, rather than say, I'm going to get up in the morning, catch the train, go up to London uh, and come back again, I'm going to get up in the morning, uh, have a shower and do writing for three hours. And you can say, that's what we're going to do. Excellent. Um, what advice would you... I'll just finish with this before we go to quick fire round. What advice do you have for aspiring authors? We have quite a few people who listen to the show. They, they want to write. Uh, what advice would you have for them? My advice would be to stick with it and to actually write things that you know about or you can research it's a lot easier look when i first started writing way back and i've i've written a number of books but it, it was difficult to write with and do the research these days 
you know, you don't need research. You've got Google. Yes. You know, you know. I want if I want to know uh, as as we did, uh, you know, what is happening in Fallujah in uh, Iraq or whatever. You can actually go to Google. You can get the maps up. You can look at the streets. You can actually see. I mean, you can actually do your research. So, so do your research. Yes. yes. Make your story believable by putting facts in. If you mm-hmm. put facts in, that if people check and say, "Oh, yeah, that has actually worked," you know, that is that's true. Then they will believe the fiction. Marvelous. So, are you ready, Mr. Henderson, for the quick fire round? I am indeed. All right. <laughs> What is your favourite ever spy novel? Well, it's the, it's a number. It's the Bernard Sampson trilogies. Brilliant. That's how uh, this that's why this podcast was born because I'd read all nine of them, and all my friends are interested in football, beer, and women, which is nothing wrong with that. But none of them are interested in spy novels. Well, so I'm, that's in, why I'm, I'm interested in all of those. Actually. Absolutely. <laughs> and that's why we set the podcast up. And now we have thousands of listeners that. Uh, and in fact, we actually went to Berlin, um, and Len sent us a lovely note. We did a Bernard Sampson tour of Berlin with a few listeners, and uh, traipsed all around where where Bernard and Werner were. And, yeah, uh, it, was, it was a fun. Well, day and of course, you've got to, if you you read, you've got to read Winter as well to which actually. Which which actually takes you into that, uh, which yes. sets out the history of, of the hotel and everything from, from way back. Uh, yes. And that's another really good read. Of course. Yes. What is your favourite spy film? The Ipcris File. What is your favourite spy TV show? SSGB, which okay. was on about uh, three or four years ago, yes. wasn't it? I enjoyed that thoroughly because that's one of Len Dayton's lesser known books. And I yes. thought it, that was, it's really interesting to think that the, uh, the Nazis took over England and what would happen. And I, so I, I really did enjoy that one. Brilliant. Um, who is your favourite spy character? You won't, go, you won't be surprised to learn Bernard Sampson. So that's. Yeah, yeah. I, I, what I can agree. I say? What can I say? I agree. Uh, who is your favourite 007 actor? I'm old. Sean Connery. There's, okay. There is no. There are no James Bonds other than uh, uh, than Sean Connery. There's a lot of our younger listeners who think he's the best as well. So I think it always comes down to age. But uh, who is your favourite spy villain? Well, I, 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 you know, I don't really have a, a spy villain as such. But I mean, Blowfield, in, who was one of uh, in the James Bond novels. Yes. But, but I wouldn't say uh, you can't have a favourite villain. You know, you either have a favourite fat spy, but the villains. Are, you don't want to be favourites, do you? Yeah, you haven't met some of our listeners. They have, they have some favourite villains. Um, favourite spy author? Only one. Len Dayton. Fantastic. So finally, you're working undercover in a hostile country, and you're allowed to ask for the following. One book, one spy gadget, one spy character, and for you, Mr. Henderson, one politician to help you escape, one bottle of booze, and one record or CD to listen to. Which book would you ask for? Uh, I'd ask for a one-time uh, code book. Because I think a one-time code book would actually be very helpful if you want to communicate anonymously. Right. What about a spy gadget? I'd love, I'd really like, I'd like one of these anyway, a, a, a smartphone that was connected to the satellite so you didn't have to worry, or you didn't have to worry about having a signal. So yes. a satellite mobile phone, because that would be very helpful if you were behind enemy lines. It would. Uh, which spy character would you call upon to help you escape? Oh, it's got to be Bernard Sampson. And what about a politician to help you escape? Joe Biden. Because really? with, if you have the leader of the strongest country in the world behind you helping you, you're going to succeed. He's going to get you out. Good answer. I didn't expect that one. What about a bottle of booze? Gin. Bottle of gin. I thought about this one, by the way, because my favourite drink is, is cognac. But, yeah. but I thought, if you've got gin, you can disguise that as water. Yes. And so behind the lines, you want something clear. Excellent. And finally, what about a record, CD, piece of music to listen to? Yeah. yeah. Um, Oceans, Essential Iron Audi, uh, which is uh, Ludovico Iron Audi, beautiful piano music, background music, excellent to write stories to. Brilliant. We'll add that to the show notes because I've, I've never listened to that. So not, I'll, uh, yeah, maybe I'll recognise it if I hear it. But uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Have you got an Echo? Have you got a, an Alexa? Yes. Uh, Alexa, play Oceans, Essential Iron Audi. You will be blown away. You've just set everyone's Alexas off. That this is the spivery. <laughs> Daddy didn't say anything naughty. Uh, Mr. Henderson, you're a very, very busy politician. I thank you so much for uh, inviting me to Westminster today and having a conversation about your spy writing. Shane, it's my pleasure. Thank you. 
Thanks for listening to the Spybrary Podcast. You don't have to wait for the next episode. Join the conversation happening now at facebook.com slash spybrary and on Twitter at spybrary.